afternoon and uh, good morning to everybody and welcome to this actually final session of our webinar. It's, it's been so far a fascinating and uh, very engaging event and we are uh, grateful for all the speakers and all the preparation and also for all those who have participated in the discussion. Uh, we'd like to take forward now the discussion. My name is Robert Fosler and I'm a lecturer. I teach systematic theology here at the Faculty of Theology at Stellenbosch University. I'm also a doctoral student of Professor Smith and I, I, I was also his colleague. Uh, so I'm also grateful and see it as a privilege to participate in, in this capacity as chair for this session. Now, uh, many will will know that uh, when Professor Smith turned 60, we had a Feshgrift and many participated in that of his colleagues, of his friends. It, it was quite an extensive volume. Uh, many of those who are online now also contributed with excellent papers to that. And it was called Living Theology. And uh, this uh, webinar now, as is its title, uh, Living legacy. So this idea of something living, something continuing, I think that is very much part of how Professor Schmidt himself think about theology. And I, I was again struck in one of the previous talks also by the idea of uh, electio uh, continua that, that Hannah used. And I think in many ways we can say that what we will do in this first part of the session is something of uh, the continuation of a legacy, a type of traditio continua. And therefore, where the previous speakers read specific papers by Prof. Prof. Smith and responded to various aspects of his uh, theology, of his thinking, what we will have now in this session is we've asked two students busy with their doctoral work also to, to say a bit about their own work and because they also engage the work then of Professor Smith as part of the, their thinking and that they think also with him in terms of the, the, the themes of their doctoral dissertation. So we're very fortunate uh, to have R.C. Uh, Jungter, who is from Princeton Theological Seminary, and then also Marius Lowe, who is from Stellenbosch University, doing a joint degree also with the Fee University in Amsterdam. Um, now, what we will do is I'll, I'll just ask them to briefly introduce themselves and uh, after they've introduced themselves, I will uh, again pose a, a question to them uh, that they can also share something of their research. So, so RC, if we can start with you, if you can just uh, say something about your background, your institutional affiliation, and also about the topic of your doctoral research. RC, you can uh, unmute your, yourself and unmute your camera and... Um, Robert, um, I, unfortunately, I can't unmute RC, only he is able to do that. Um, so I've clicked the, the unmute button, but um, it, it, might, it might be necessary for him to leave the meeting and rejoin and okay. perhaps switch your order around. Okay, so let's, let's do it this way. Uh, so what I can ask Marius, maybe if you can introduce yourself and then also continue uh, that you use the first 12 or, or, or minutes or so to, to say something about how you engage also Prof. Smith in your own work and you know you continue and that will then give us some time uh, also to, to sort out just the sound of RC so that he can also do his presentation in that way. Uh, so Marius, if it's in order with you, then we continue this way. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to be here, and it's really an honor and a privilege for me. Um, I am currently living in Amsterdam, where I'm doing a joint degree between the Freie Universiteit and Stellenbosch University. 
under the supervision of um, Prof. Robert and Eddie van der Borg. Um, my title of my research is Reimagining the Relationship Between Justification and Justice, a Theological Ethical Inquiry in Conversation with South African uh, Reformed Voices. I, um, before this, I completed my master's thesis also under the supervision of Professor Smith um, on the topic of reconcil uh, reconciling holiness and justice, a critical analysis of Nicholas Walterstorff's philosophical theological understanding of Shalom. And uh, just before starting my PhD, I was a full-time minister in a student congregation uh, on the uh, campus of the University of the Free State. It's really lovely to be here, Prof. Smith. Happy birthday. It's, it's so nice to celebrate uh, this together. So I'm going to start. <clears throat> For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith. This text was echoed by Prof. Smith on 27 November 2016 at the event of our legitimization as ministers into the Dutch and Uniting Reformed Churches in the historical Esachistich congregation in Bala. The date is significant. On the one end, it marked the end of our undergraduate studies in Stellenbosch, uh, but also for the two years prior to that event, students in South Africa went through what eventually culminated in Feast Must Fall, a movement calling for quality, decolonized, and free education. The upcoming year, our first year of ministry was the 500th year of the Reformation. So, Stuck between these two realities, in that moment in time in Balhar, trying to understand how our reformed faith links to social justice, Prof. Smith's sermon was a signpost worth looking back on. Like a golden thread, it weaved together what I've heard from him in our highly engaging classes, his supervision of my master's thesis, and through many of his writings. Firstly, uh, Prof. Smith asked, why would someone be ashamed of the gospel? He says, we lose trust in the gospel, doubting whether the gospel is really credible, reliable, trustworthy, worthwhile following. It means that we become silent when we should witness, that we are no longer ready to give account of the hope within us, that we back away from the implications and radical consequences of this gospel. And then this all becomes clear in the second question of Prof. Smith's sermon. Why then is Paul not ashamed? of the gospel. Because, says Smith, following Paul, it is the power of God. The gospel is powerful in itself as message, as good news. To make it even clearer, the ministry of the gospel is about what God's self is doing. The righteousness of God revealed in Jesus Christ is not about God's character, but about God's action. In the words of the Ballard Confession, God has revealed God's self as the one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people. Writing shortly after the acceptance of the concept confession of Ballard in 1982, Smith explains how there can be no disagreement about this elementary confessional language. It is rooted in the revelation of Christ so as to rule out speculation or natural theology. Throughout the Bible, he says, praise is uttered to this God. Therefore, he continues, the confessional statement that God is in a special way, the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wrong, is equally an age-old and ancient Christian conviction that God is the one who helps the helpless. That God is just, he continues, should for no second mean that God is neutral and unaffected in the face of human pain and suffering, injustice, exploitation, and oppression. No, the biblical God is the God of justice exactly because this God stands on the side of those whom are trampled on. Moreover, he says this confession is not about some ideologically inspired or subjective statements. No, confessing that God is just is at the heart of the Christian faith and confession. This is also what made Jesus' miracles so miraculous and so incomprehensible, says Smith elsewhere. God is a God who for human sake cannot stand aside in this matter, cannot rest. As Lutheran pastor Manas Butelezi already said in 1976, this is not only theoretical, theological, or doctrinal, as if Christ dressed in flowing golden dust-free robes 
portrayed as coming to save humanity, toiling and the dirt in the dirt and the grime of daily life. No, Christ is involved in it, standing alongside people. More recently, Smith made the same point again by looking at Bart in his essay, Justification and Justice. Smith argues that God is in no way aloof to human suffering and the seriousness of sin, evil, and injustice. Rather, we learn to recognize and name our sin precisely there where God is, where God not merely forbids it, but in fact engages it, actively confronts it, and shows God's self to be deeply affected by it and involved with it. The event where this is most clearly seen is in the reconciliation of the word with God in Jesus Christ on the cross. It is when contemplating this face of God on the cross, says Smith using Bush, that we see God's self in unity with the one who suffers there, in the lowliness of this suffering and without any alteration of God's divine nature, yet also without any weakening of the gravity of his humiliation. God is passionately and compassionately involved in rooting out all forms of sin, evil, and injustice. But this would immediately be read together with the third point of his sermon that day, that the gospel is also the power for salvation. He wants to emphasize that the love and the mercy of God is not made prisoner of God's justice. Rather, it is operative at every step along the way of redemption as the outpouring of God's wrath and judgment, but for us and our salvation. The issue is not that the wrong should be punished, but that it should be completely removed. Again, quoting from Bart, Smith explains beautifully, the very heart of the atonement is the overcoming of sin, but not out of any desire for vengeance or retribution, or because God seeks satisfaction through some sacrificial victim to become more conciliatory. No, the wrath or the justice of God does not extinguish the love of God. It is, in fact, the redemptive fire of God's love, which is but, of course. In this way, says Smith, grace and right are not two things, let alone an antithesis. They are one and the same thing. The whole point, says Smith, is that this justification is not only nominal as though, rather it is very real. People can believe it, trust it, and need no longer resist it. It reaches and affects us. This means, he says, that the judgment is not opposed to grace, but is in fact the form of grace. It is namely that form of grace that cannot be reconciled with human wrong. It is that element in this God's grace that makes grace an act of opposition against evil, including our self-destruction. The grace of this gracious God would not be grace without judgment over the sin that destroys, denies, and violates. The judgment of this God is never without grace, but it is the redemptive fire of God's love, judging because it is merciful. On the other side of this judgment of God, human beings are raised from the dead. They are created new. God does not remove the wrong, but also establishes the right. With justification comes the lordship of this God over us. Therefore, says Smith so regularly, we can see things differently as subspecies Christi, thinking our way into God's world. In this way, justification is real and active, renewing and life-giving. As he beautifully summarizes in his paradigms essay, because of this completely free act of God's grace in Jesus Christ to be with us, the doctrine of reconciliation is, in a secondary sense, also about the new human subject that is thereby constituted and called with a vocation to respond to God's act of grace. Therefore, Prosmit could remind us in his sermon that day, this is what makes the good news so good. God uses this message to save, which means to justify, to forgive, to reconcile, to sanctify, to heal, to make new, to transform, to resurrect, to liberate, to assure, to comfort, to bless, to bring joy, to move, to inspire, to strengthen, to empower, to warn, to guide, to enlighten, to lead, to protect, to keep, to guard, to feed, to satisfy thirst, to nourish, to make flourish, to bring justice, to give peace, and so much more. Finally, 
for Smith as for Bart, the central definition of reconciliation, God with us, is the fulfillment of the covenant between God and humanity. God's covenant of grace showing itself to the undeserving as grace for the most rich, the wholeness of life, as, as Alan Busak says. So where am I going with this? In an interesting conclusion to his essay on justification and justice, Smith remarks how Western notions of justice tainted our understanding of both divine justice and justification. It is fair to say, he says, that popular piety is based on an understanding of divine justice and accordingly of justification that is primarily moral and legal. Indeed, as Bart State and Smith expanded on, how can the doctrine of reconciliation be so deprived of this radiant basis, so dull, so indifferent to the questions of human beings themselves? so that it is so lacking in joy. In this sense, the Western tradition has made it difficult to appreciate the biblical view of divine justice, especially the integral link between judging and saving. The apartheid government, as Nicholas Wolterstorff so often showed, could implement totalitarian right order systems of justice that was floating above humanity, bound by duties and obligations to this order, it missed the very cry for justice coming from the downtrodden. The church followed suit, not standing where God stood. Rather, it developed a piety equally unconcerned and aloof, more concerned with the souls of white saints than God's active saving justice. It goes without saying then, in an ethics flowing from justification, attention, as Smith also calls for, should be given to notions of human justice, the doing of the little righteousness, or what, or what the Russell Botman called for after the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification. But in this regard, Alan Busak so successfully showed that our process of justice in South Africa need not move only between the confines of revenge and forgiveness, between retribution and restoration, between mercy and justice. No, we need in South Africa that kind of justice that takes seriously not only personal forgiveness, but also restoration and restitution, that calls forth remorse and conversion, moral obligation and political compulsion, not only appealing to interdependence, but also to rights and wrongs, where justice is not only implied, but where justice is demanded not only calling for deeds of kindness and compassion and caring, but also for sacrificial engagement on the side of the powerful and the privileged for the sake of justice for the oppressed and the exploited. Not only recognizing that the other is human, but that the other is trampled upon, purposely put and kept at the bottom, not only about inclusion from the margin, but social inversion, rectifying that requires lifting up the low ones, but also casting down of the high ones. Indeed, as Busak says, for doing the small deeds of righteousness, we need the full power of the conviction that this is God's cause as it is the cause of Jesus, and that the pursuit of justice for the lowly and the downtrodden, the weak and the wrong, is our enduring calling, justice and only justice, you shall pursue. I think with this said, my work only really begins. I suppose taking Prof. Uh, Prof. Taka seriously, uh, we need to totally stand around the fire now of Black African feminist, womanist, and LGBTQ theologies, where the buffalo is already being bribed uh, and where we can learn quite a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marius, uh, uh, Marius, also for what you have uh, shared. Uh, we, we really appreciate those, those comments and also for the way in which you are thinking with Professor Smith, also in your own research and for giving us a glimpse into that world uh, and all the best also for the continuation of your studies. Uh, we will just try again. Uh, uh, we hope we can hear RC now. Uh, can we maybe have some indication, RC, if, if you can turn on your camera, your audio, uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing you and hope it's possible. It's 
seems wonderful. Uh, we can see you. You can continue. Um, if you can just introduce yourself and uh, then you can also share something of your own research. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about my devices. I don't know, I could not unmute with my uh, primary device, which is more re uh, reliable when it comes to connectivity, but I hope this device works too. Uh, I am R.C. Jongte. I come from India, from the Northeastern part of India. I'm currently a PhD candidate uh, in systematic theology at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary. And I wish a uh, happy 70th birthday to Professor Dersmith, and I'm really happy to be part of this symposium. My presentation is on, <clears throat> is titled Election and Preferential Option for the Poor, Rethinking the Doctrine of Election. In the reception histories of Reformed theology, the doctrine of election is often one of conflict and contestation, and therefore perhaps best characterized as uh, ambiguous. This is true of reformed churches in, uh, in apartheid South Africa as well. Nicole Koopman talks about the ambiguous role played by reformed theology in the conflict, saying, some members of this tradition provided a theological legitimacy for the ideology and political system of apartheid, while others, by far the, the, major, the, the majority in the end, opposed apartheid on theological and even confessional grounds. And we know that Professor Dirk Smith is one of those anti-apartheid theologians who engage deeply in the task of reclaiming the reformed tradition to challenge injustice and to, and to work toward formulating a theology that provides the basis for our life <clears throat> together in justice. In this short presentation, I will engage Smith's treatment of the doctrine of election primarily through his 2018 World Fit Lectures here at Princeton Theological Seminary. Through my engagement with him, I, I will try to show how his work resonates with and informs my current research. Perhaps also how my project could complement his thought in some way. In order to give context to my conversation with, with Smith's idea, let me give a brief summary of my dissertation. My current research is on a liberationist reading of Karl Barth's doctrine of election. That is, reading Barth, reading Barth from the perspective of liberation theology, in which I try to find a theo-ontological basis for the central liberationist tenet of God's preferential option for the poor. Using Barth and through him, connect election and preferential option for the poor. Adopting this hermeneutical approach in my research, I propose a conception of divine being that grounds God's liberative acts in history in favor of the poor and the oppressed in the being of God itself, while also arguing that divine election to be God for humanity, particularly the God of the oppressed, has ontological consequences for God, that is, for God, for divine self-constitution. Coming to Smith's hermeneutic of doctrine, Smith stands in the Reformation tradition of reading ecclesial and theological tradition that seeks to reinterpret, revitalize, liberate, and make liberating a core Christian doctrine. However, not necessarily in the exact way that a doctrine is formulated and interpreted in bygone eras. After all, didn't Abraham Kuyper say, our task is not to copy the doctrine of election of earlier generations, but to find our own, our own answers amidst the spiritual winds blowing in our time. We should not revive all debates and defend positions from our past, but risk finding new ways so that today's children may once again in their own way feel the doctrine of election vibrating in themselves. Smith's reclaiming of the doctrine of election is inspired by the Dutch theologian Herman Bavink, who claims that, I quote, election is a source of inexpressibly, inexpressibly great comfort since it promises hope for even the most wretched. This is central to Smith's rethinking of the doctrine. 
The doctrine came alive again for him and other anti-apartheid theologians in South Africa because of its pastoral, inclusive, welcoming, and liberating message. The discovery that election operates according to grace, not on any human merit, and therefore there is hope precisely and for even the most wretched. This discovery animates a conviction to wrest tradition back from its misappropriation. The Belhar Confession puts it in a forceful way, asserting that God is in a special way, the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wrong. Smith remarks that, that what he thinks he heard from Buffing and uh, was affirmed by many voices and witnesses when interpreted and understood in this light the doctrine of election provides the grammar for life together. It offers a language that will not make people lose hope, a vision of a world where we recognize one another, where we recognize one another as objects of God's eternal love and treat each other as such, and to extend God's compassionate love and welcome to strangers. For Smith, the question is not how accurate are our doctrinal propositions, but the way we speak that matters. Is it welcoming or horrifying? Does it result in formation and transformation? Elections should form the church and church, the church's way of being in the world, he argues. The significance Smith attached to the rhetorical effect of how one speaks of the doctrine of election is, skept, is captured well in his quotation of Archbishop Desmond Tutu for whom, I quote, the most blasphemous aspect of the apartheid was not the great suffering it caused, it, it caused its victims, but the fact that it could make a child of God doubt that he or she is a child of God. As, I, as, as, as indicated above, Smith is not primarily concerned with the content of the doctrine or how it should be formulated, but to use his own words, rather on ways in which election language is used and perceived, experienced and suffered, that is, the doctrine's relation to a certain way of living. While this emphasis is crucial, particularly in the context of apartheid South Africa, I think my project is in a way an attempt to get to this question from a slightly different route. That is to regulate why and how election is spoken of, safeguard it from brazen misuse and bring together what may be described as the why and the how of election talk with the what aspect. By the what aspect, I mean elections ontological foundation and its formulation on the basis of this foundation. More on this uh, in a moment. Throughout this lecture series, Smith compellingly shows why, how we speak of election matters. In fact, his lectures revolved around unpacking the significance of this. To lift up one example, Smith drawing on Heiko Obermann's historicized interpretation of Kelvin's doctrine of predestination says that says that uh, one cannot understand Calvin's do, uh, doctrine apart from its socio-historical context. That is, what Calvin said cannot be understood without focusing on why Calvin said it. And Calvin speaks of election as a word of comfort for the church in for the church in flight, the refugees, those without valid passports, for whom election becomes their identity card. This crucial insight about the fundamental importance of the why and the how of speaking the language of election I learned from Smith. This being said, I think my project is uh, supplement, supplementing Smith's view by offering an ontological grounding to the doctrine, thereby giving an account of why election is and should be hope inspiring for even the most wretched. My argument is that election understood as God's preferential option for the poor within the scope of God's universal love is not a theological proposition deduced from abstract theory, theoretical reasoning or from empirical observations about people's response to Christian preaching. It is based on God's revelation of God's self as the God of the oppressed as witnessed in the Bible. And divine revelation is a historical manifestation of who God is essentially. Hence, the liberation of the poor and the oppressed is not to be perceived as a contingent divine attitude, which could be otherwise, or a sentiment of divine pity. Rather, it flows from the being of, from the being of God, 
from who from God who freely and graciously wills to be God in no other way than this, to be God for us in a covenantal relationship, particularized in divine favor for the poor. Therefore, James Cone is right when he contends that the liberation of the oppressed is part of the innermost nature of God. I think this liberationist divine ontology has important bearing on the rhetorical function of election. In this formulation, faithful and authentic election talk and election language cannot but be liberative, particularly for the most wretched. The ontological foundation norms how election is to be used, perceived, experienced, and talked about. Finally, I also see myself as pushing Smith's and Kuyper's use of the phrase hope for even the most wretched in an explicitly liberationist direction by making it point to the poor and the oppressed, the non-persons, the excluded, those rendered invisible, people who die before their time. Consequently, the vision of life together that election makes possible is wholeheartedly affirmed when it is made to go through the narrow gate of preferential option for the poor. The sequence is this, justice slash liberation, then life together. I frame it this way because I think the universality of God's love that includes a life of togetherness under God's reign requires a predilection, a preference toward the least. The option for the poor is the narrow path through which election operates and opens the possibility for life together in justice. Along this line, I give undeserved assent to Smith's argument that election should form and transform the church's way of being in the world so that there is hope precisely and for even the most wretched. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, RC, for what you have presented, also to give us uh, some understanding of your research and also how you engage with Prof. Smith, uh, also as you construct your own uh, very interesting and creative argument. So thank you, thank you very much. It was also uh, good to, to listen to, to Marius and to, to RC. And now uh, we are continuing our celebrations, we can say, and we have asked a few people just to, to say a few words in honor of, of Durki on this occasion of his 70th birthday. Uh, of course, we, every one of us can say something, uh, could have said something and could add many things, many stories, uh, speak about his immense influence on us. Our lives uh, but for the purposes of this event we've asked uh, seven or so uh, friends colleagues uh, and we know that he respects all of them very much uh, and they work uh, so what we will do now in, in in the next part of this session we have asked uh, professor reginell professor wolfgang huber professor godwin akper professor etienne de Folier, professor michael welker professor denise ackerman and Professor Nico Koopman, just to, to briefly, in, in a few minutes, each give a, a type of commend, commendatio uh, in, in the light of Professor Smith's life and his, his work. And uh, we have, uh, some of them will speak uh, live. And uh, in terms of uh, also Professor Akper and uh, Professor Ackerman, we have a recording that we, we will uh, play. Uh, so without uh, further ado, let, let's, us, let's continue. I'll also just introduce all of these speakers and then uh, give them the opportunity to say a few words. Uh, now, our first speaker in this regard is Professor Reggie Nell, uh, who is also at the moment uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Theology here at Stellenbosch University. And uh, before becoming the Dean of the Faculty, also the fac faculty from which he graduated, he was a professor in missiology at the University of South Africa, and he is an internationally respected leader in the discipline of the disciplines of youth ministry as well as missiology, uh, also globally, but uh, also in the Reformed churches in Southern Africa and also here in the community of Stellenbosch. And uh, as a also intellectual leader, he serves on the uh, board of the Council of the Stellenbosch University. Uh, so it, it's great to have him not only as Dean, but also here to say a few words ab about Professor Smith. Uh, thank you very much, Reggie. 
Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Professor Fost Fosler uh, and colleagues uh, for, for inviting me to say a few words. Uh, good afternoon and Morweni Bukhawam. I want to uh, start by congratulating Professor uh, Smith on his 70th birthday. It is a singular honor to congratulate you, Professor Smith, on behalf of the Faculty of Theology at Stellenbosch. And um, I'm sure Professor uh, Kupman will say a few words also on behalf of the university at large. Professor Smith, you are a distinguished colleague amongst us. Uh, in particular, also here at Stellenbosch University in the faculty, you are revered, respected, and I dare say loved. Uh, many of the colleagues here still fondly remember uh, their interactions with you, uh, the small ways in which you showed yourself not only as an international respected uh, theologian, but also as a human being, as a mentor, as somebody that, that colleagues also, as I indicated, loved. And I wondered why also within the broader church here in South Africa, uh, we share the, uh, the Uniting Reformed Church as our church uh, base, uh, but broadly you are respected. And I wondered why. Is it because of the voluminous uh, publications that you have uh, uh, published? Uh, is it because of the students that, um, that have completed their studies under you? And today and yesterday, again, we were amazed uh, by the intellectual uh, uh, capital that has been uh, shaped and formed to a large degree under your hand. Is it the content, perhaps, your contribution to the Belhar Confession, the formulation, and subsequently also, of course, the form formation of, of the Uniting Reform Church. It is possible. And I think uh, many of us over the last two days have affirmed that that um, is definitely one of the reasons and perhaps the important reasons why uh, we hold you in high esteem. Allow me, however, to share three other observations uh, that um, I want to also leave with, with the colleagues here, why I also why I think uh, that you are held in, in this esteem. Number one, while you are aware that you remain a child of your time, you remain a, le a, a reader, a learner. You remain open for colleagues. You remain open for communities. You remain open for new uh, books to still challenge you and to still uh, be able to learn from that. And that is a rare quality amongst academics. And we want to acknowledge that today. Yes, you are a child of your time and therefore you are, and I want to put it in Afrikaans uh, and I will translate, you are uh, gewortel in a bepaald traditie. You are rooted in a particular tradition. Now, it would be, it would be tempting to, uh, to be swayed by new, uh, perhaps fads, perhaps populism, in terms of how we do our theology. Yet, and we've uh, learned over the last few days, in many ways, um, you, you remained rooted, even though you were able to reflect and dialogue and journey with so many different voices. Many times you were criticized for remaining rooted in your traditions. And in many uh, instances, you, you felt the critique even from your own students. But today, and um, Johann, uh, John Clarsen also referred to your humanity. We want to affirm uh, your humanity. And having said that, it meant vulnerability. It meant accepting our, our humanness, perhaps our flaws, our limit, limits. Um, in one of the uh, responses to the work of Willy Jonker, 
uh, Pete Nodea uh, said that uh, Professor Lavelle Jonker remained, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, rooted in his Eurocentric or European traditions. And it was fascinating for me to read how Professor Jonker affirmed and said, uh, yes, I remain uh, to a large degree rooted in the European tradition, but perhaps it will be my students who will continue uh, to engage newer questions that our continent, Africa, and others have um, uh, raised. And I thought that is so appropriate also of you uh, in the way that you uh, set your students free and uh, our colleagues free to continue their work and ask new questions and in humility also dialogue and listen to them. So with these few words, I wanted to affirm that you embodied what you uh, taught, you embodied what you wrote. And therefore, I think that also plays a key role in why you are valued, respected, revered, and also loved. May you have a wonderful uh, birthday further. May you have a wonderful years of fruitful service further, but also with your family that you love so much, your children and your grandchildren. A happy birthday. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean. Thank you very much, Reggie, for these, these words. Uh, be, before we ask uh, uh, Professor Huber uh, to say a few words, and I will also introduce him, uh, also welcome to Professor Michal Welker. Uh, I see that it seems that there's trouble in connecting with your audio. Uh, can I maybe just have an indication if you can uh, hear us or can speak? Um, uh, if not, then I, I think while the other sp uh, speakers uh, just say a few words that uh, it, it might be then just the best that you just uh, disconnect and then reconnect again uh, with the link and then hopefully that will we'll sort that out. So, so thank you very much for that, Professor uh, Valker. Uh, so uh, yes, next up we, we have to say a few words, Professor Wolfgang Huber. And he also don't need much introduction. He's extraordinary prof professor both at Heidelberg University and at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Uh, he was for many years professor in systematic theology at Heidelberg University. Uh, he was also before that at Marburg. And he's a retired bishop of the Evangelical Church in Berlin, Brandenburg, and also a former chairperson of the Council of Churches of the Evangelical Church in Germany. Uh, he's a fellow at the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Studies and uh, also honorary professor here at uh, Stellenbosch University at the Faculty of Theology and somebody with a deep connection to South Africa uh, and uh, somebody that has published widely and his work has ex 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 uh, also had a great influence also on Prof. Smith, uh, but also to, to many others. So uh, Prof. Huber, uh, thank you very much for your willingness uh, also to participate in this way. Dear Dirke, dear colleagues and students, dear friends, it is a great joy for, for me to contribute uh, to this pre-birthday uh, event. Um, and it's a great honor for me uh, to express my uh, deep connection to Dirke. Dirk Smit is a master of friendship. Therefore, therefore it's no wonder that his whole theology breathes the spirit of friendship. In dialogue, he makes the theology of others shine in a way that sometimes goes far beyond what the author himself or herself was able to say. He listens carefully and reads closely. But he does so with an integrative power that he applies not only to his own theology, but also to the theology of others. Since our first encounters in the 1980s, I have always felt that Dirki understands me better than I understand myself. His friendship is characterized by great faithfulness. Remembering theologians, those from earlier times like Calvin or Karl Barth, but also uncounted contemporaries from A to W, 
from Denise Ackermann to Konrad Wettmer. This remembering um, of theologians is part of his way of doing theology. His choice of topics also stems from dialogue. He answers questions that others put to him and develops answers from these questions that the questioner could not have expected. That is why he is so often asked when clear guidance is needed on pressing questions of church practice and public witness. His decisive importance for the Belhar Confessions remains the most important example. For theology in Germany, Dirk Smit is Master Humboldt par excellence. He has been a Humboldt Foundation Research Fellow in Germany at least eight, eight times since, since 1988. In addition, he has held other fellowships and visiting professorships, especially in Marburg, Heidelberg, and Berlin. At the Humboldt University, as well as in Stellenbosch, we are still connected as honorary professors. In Berlin, the third in our group is the sociologist Hans Joas, who sends on this way very warm and friendly greetings to your birthday boy. So inseparable as are the three of us that we were also together in Stellenbosch. Hans Joas and, and I meditated, discussed, and wrote about faith and fabric under Dirkie's equally generous and inspiring guidance. That too is a sign of Dirk, Dirk Smith's mastery of friendship. Yeah, it looks like it's in the same condition as I'm buying it now. Can I continue? For a long period of my life, I had church leadership responsibilities and could do academic work only within narrow limits. When this period came to an end, Dirki suggested I should come to STIAS, the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study as a fellow. He wanted to encourage me to find my way back to academic theology, focused reading and writing. With cheerful irony, he called institutes like STIAS professorial repair shops. I enjoyed this professorial repair shop that calls itself by good reasons a creative space for the mind, where I've been able to spend many fruitful weeks, make friends and deepen my love for the Western Cape in the years from uh, 2010 onwards. I will close with words in which Dirk himself characterizes his theological journey as a theology of friendship. These are his words. Friendship has always played a key role in my own doing of theology. Theology for me has always meant doing theology with others and for others. Theology for me has always been about friendship, whether with students, postgraduate students, colleagues, ministers, ecumenical believers from different traditions, theologians from abroad, or simply books and publications, articles and sources. Yes, that's how he wants to convince all of us from first year students to older semesters, you can also find friends in the books of a library. For that, however, you have to open them. This theology of friendship, dear Dirki, is a great gift. I wish you that you can continue to cultivate it for a long time with God's grace. I wish you together with Ria, God's blessing on all your ways. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hubert Wolfgang, for, for these, these words. We also uh, now uh, have the opportunity to listen to Professor Godwin Akper, uh, who is from Nigeria. Many of you will know Godwin. He is a doctoral graduate at Stellenbosch University, where he graduated in 2004. And Professor Smith was also his supervisor. And he has returned to Stellenbosch for several occasions for sabbaticals and for research projects, also as a researcher within the Bayer's Nudia Center for Public Theology. At the moment, he is Professor of Systematic Theology at National Open University 
uh, in Nigeria and is publishing widely on themes that, such as African uh, Christologies and also on several contemporary ethical challenges uh, from theological perspectives. Uh, Godwin, it's, it's good to have you. And uh, we will now listen to the recorded message that you prepared. I'm in Aquil. I'm in Nigerian. I'm residing and working in Nigeria. I'm Professor Deki Jacobin Smith, former doctoral student at the University of Stellenbosch, Faculty of Theology. I'm a living testimony to Deki's enormous contribution to human and knowledge capacity building around the globe. In his contribution to academia, church work, and public life, all is demonstrated through my own academic, church, and public life anywhere I go. My pastoral work at Bristol Congregation of the former Dutch Mission Church in Nigeria, now Universal Reformed Church in Kesti, the teaching of systematic theology and apologetics at Reformed Theological Seminary in Kaa, my teaching of Christian ethics and philosophy at the University of Ankara, and now my teaching of systematic theology and ecclesiology at Nigeria's Open University, or attest to and bear marks of Turkey's orientation to what theology means to different contexts in life situations as it is lived in those contexts. For example, Becky's conviction that theology should speak to different contexts with all their complexities so that those operating in those contexts could see in the same way has always guided my work in my own context. Becky and his colleagues, Michael Koopman, Robert Fosler, and many others now at Bayer's Media Center for Public Theology, deliberately ensured that I emerge as a theologian whose theology speak to African life situations as they are lived in different parts of the continent. Thank you, we, we will contribute, we'll continue to celebrate your contributions to life, the theology that speak to us, that speak to our context, that speak to our own people in their various contexts. As we celebrate 70th birthday, we are celebrating 70 years of this engagement with this wonderful gift that we received from God. Thank you, Deki, and happy 78th birthday. We love you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for those uh, words, Godwin, and uh, I think it is uh, will be much. It is much appreciated. Uh, we are also glad to have Professor Etienne de Villiers with us, a very good friend of of Durkee and uh, with a long relationship with him. Uh, he was the professor of Christian ethics at the Faculty of Theology at the University of Pretoria. Uh, before that, he was also at Huguenot. College and uh, he is especially well known in South Africa, South African circles, but also internationally for his work uh, on ethics and then more particularly on an ethics of responsibility. And he's the author of uh, the major work entitled Revisiting Mac Max Weber's Ethic of Responsibility that was published a few years ago by Moore and Sibek. Uh, Etienne, great that you can also uh, join us there from, from Pingle Bay, I assume. Uh, so we look forward also to listen uh, to you and to hear your tribute. Thank you, Robert. Now, Dirkie and I have been friends for more than 40 years. As could be expected from someone like Dirkie, this has been a friendship characterized by quite a few joint projects, both social and academic in nature. Every, everyone who has the slightest acquaintance with Dirkie would know Durkee loves joint projects. Among the joint projects of a social nature, several memorable tours for our two families undertook in South Africa and abroad stand out. Now, I could keep you busy for hours talking about the unforgettable experiences we had during, during these joint tours. 
I would, however, like to concentrate on two joint projects of an academic nature. In the 90s, Durki approached me with a proposal of co-authoring three articles introducing to South African theologians and theological students some groundbreaking international perspectives on fundamental ethical issues. The three articles were eventually published in the theological journal Skrif in Kerk, the present Verbum et Ecclesia, of the Faculty of Theology of the University of Pretoria. Among others, we explained and discussed in the articles the German theologian Eduard Tuit's distinction of six steps of responsible moral decision making and the American theologian James Gustafson's distinction of four modes of moral speech, namely the prophetic, narrative, ethical, and policy modes. Durkis foresight that these articles could be of service to South Africans proved to be correct in the aftermath. As many theological students in their master theses and doctoral dissertations and many theologians in articles on especially public theology made use of these distinctions. In the first decade of the present century, I asked Turkey's advice on the idea of founding a new lecture series in theology in honor of my father, Professor David de Villiers, who was at some stage Dean of the Faculty of Theology of the University at the University of Stellenbosch. Now, Durkee enthusiastically supported the idea and strongly contributed to the conceptualization and also institutionalization of the biannual David de Villiers Memorial Lectures at the University of Stellenbosch. It was stipulated that internationally recognized theologians, who could include, of course, also South African theologians, would be invited to present two public lectures on a topic of their choice that would one way or another deal with the interface church and society. Now, Durkee's involvement continued until his so-called retirement at Stellenbosch. He helped to reside on the invitations and played an important role in organizing the lectures at the Faculty of Theology. I'm quite proud of the lineup of theologians who accepted our invitation and presented the David de Villiers Memorial Lectures through the years. Heinrich Bedford Strom, William Stoller, Wolfgang Huber, Fritz de Lange, Wenzel van Eistien, Alan Busak, and also Durkee himself, to whose invitation he did not contribute. Why have Durkee, throughout his academic life, been willing to become heavily involved in joint and sometimes time-consuming theological projects? There are probably, probably several reasons. I would have ever want to highlight two reasons which I believe have played a role. First is generosity. Durkee is not someone who seeks recognition for himself or the numerous theological projects who originate from his creative mind. He rather from the start involves others as equal partners and allows them to share in the recognition. Second, and maybe the most important reason, because he has a Christian beliefs that communal service, serving God and others by working together with other members of the community of believers is important. One thing that through the years of interaction with Dirk as a friend, as a friend has become clear to me is that serving God, serving the church, serving others, preferably in cooperation with other people is one of the guiding motives in everything he does. Lastly, Durkee, I would like to congratulate, congratulate you also on behalf of Joan with joining our club of Septuagarians this coming Saturday. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Etienne, uh, also for, for sharing, sharing this. Now, it, it, it might be that we, uh, we still have problems with Professor uh, Welker's audio, but we will, we will try anyway. Uh, we also received from him a, a written text. So if, if we can't connect and can't hear him, then uh, I, I will read it. So we will at, at least have something of his, his words and his ideas. Uh, but uh, before we try that, let me just um, also uh, just introduce him. Professor Welker is the Senior Professor in Systematic Theology at Heidelberg 
University. Uh, he's uh, the, uh, also the director of the Research Center for International Interdisciplinary Theology and uh, has written many, many uh, also influential and wonderful books uh, that I know many of us has came to know over the years, also through the mediation of Professor Smith, and most recently he published In God's Image and Anthropology of the Spirit, uh, which was the published version of his uh, different lectures. And uh, Professor Smith also wrote a commendation for that on the, on the back cover. Uh, so it, it also testifies to their mutual respect and also their friendship over the years. Professor uh, Valker has often visited uh, South Africa, has lectured here, uh, and he's been also the subject of doctoral dissertations. And uh, we are uh, grateful and uh, privileged to have uh, you also to say something on this occasion. Uh, so let's try. Uh, Professor Velker, and see if we can hear you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, sorry about this. It, it looks that we won't be able uh, to hear him in, in person. Uh, so, so Dirky, uh, I will just read what I have in front of, uh, in front of me. And... Um, uh, Robert, Professor Velka has just managed to unmute his microphone, so we might be able to hear him, but we can't see him. Okay, that that is, uh, I think, better than me reading, better than seeing me. Um, and and uh, so let's then listen uh, to, to Professor Velka. Oh, but uh, sorry, it seems that he might not be able to hear us. Maybe that's part of the problem. So you might need to read after all. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, let me. Let Hello. Me also, by me, klappt the audio connection nicht to den. Ich weiß nicht, uh, we, es kann irgendwas auch an meinem Computer sein. Wir hatten da ja schon mal Probleme mit dem äh, Mikrofon. Da müssen wir dann den Typ. Um, Michael, we can we can hear you now, so you can continue and just read your commendation. I think what we um, what we will do, uh, Dion, uh, I, I can read it afterwards. Uh, but um, maybe we can continue to, to have the recorded version of um, uh, Professor Denise Ackerman, and then we can try one more time. And then if that fails, then I will, I will do the reading, if that is in order, Dion. Happy birthday, Dirkie. Laurie and I would like to send you our best wishes and, and our hopes for blessings in abundance. I'm afraid I have a very shaky memory, so what you're going to hear from me now are some reminiscences and a couple of thoughts that struck me when I, when I think of you. And my first thought goes back 40 years. You may not well remember it, but it was in Pretoria somewhere. I think I was, I'd finished my master's and I was working on my doctorate and it was at some gathering and I gave a paper, and I'm pretty sure the topic was something to do with women in the Christian faith. And I, had, I didn't know anybody in the audience. And I remember quite near the front, there was a man sitting looking at me very intently. And once I said something, and I noticed just a slight nod, and I took it as a nod of assent. And that was you, Dirkie. And so I want to tell you that I felt a bit affirmed then, and that was a very nice feeling. Later that evening, we met, and I remember John de Grouchy was there too. So later we became colleagues, first at UWC and then at Stellenbosch. So I have memories of conversations on theology, on our teaching, on faculty matters. And um, I remember going out to lunch once, or twice or three times even 
with a grassy rain sometimes maybe, and we thrashed around on subjects we were thinking about. Well, the years at UWC were very worthwhile, but they were not without strife. We had student demonstrations, uh, our faculty was downgraded, and as you know that, everybody knows that led to you and Russell leaving and going to Stellenbosch, and then later I joined you there. I do have memories of your large book line study up at the top uh, of the stairs where we would sit and have conversations on the, on the language of lament, on hope, on our understandings of Jesus uh, in our shared faith, and of course on spirituality. But you also helped me a lot with the reformed history of Stellenbosch University, which I was not all that familiar with. So once again, I needed to just thank you because for me, as somebody who'd started off on my tack on women's theology, etc., you were always there assisting and helping and affirming, with, and that meant a great deal to me. But I have two more academic and theological memories that I want to share with you, and the first one is Karl Rana. I think Karl Rana was the first book of proper theology that I ever read. It was that Foundations of the Christian Faith or something like that. I can't remember the title. But I remember reading Karl Rana and loving what he said about grace, about inner listening, uh, um, about pastoral care. And I remember the pastoral, the sermons uh, on, the, on the Psalms. And he meant a great deal to me at the time. And I was surprised when I discovered that you too liked Karl Rahner and had found him really somebody, you know, who shaped also something in you. But I know that in me, uh, the idea of finding God in all things was one that has stayed with me at all times. But I didn't realize at the time how Rana's Jesuit spirituality was going to influence me, which it did ultimately when I um, subsequently went into Ignatian spirituality and did the 30-day silent retreat. But Dirkie, what I wanted to say to you is you understood that and you recognized it. So I enjoyed our shared love of Rana and I wanted to just tell you that today, it was special. And secondly, in, perhaps in contrast to many people is John Calvin. Um, you know, in my first incarnation at Stellenbosch, it was 1951, and there was a kind of Calvinism there. I know it's been given many names, but it was something that I found not only difficult to understand, but not something I wanted to be part of. I could not understand why on a Sunday in the Corses, I had to wear nylon stockings in order to get food. I had no idea what that had to do with God. So my experience of Calvin, other than having to study some Calvin in my theological studies, was I just rejected him, put the books away, and that was it. Then, on my 70th birthday, you gave a paper. The title was Simple and Straightforward Question Mark. Well, my desire to write theology that was simple and straightforward set you off. And in your typical manner, in a scholarly, well-argued, meticulously documented, which is the hallmark of your theology, you wrote a paper which, in which you made comparisons between Ackermann and Calvin. Well, I was shocked, gobsmacked. I can't tell you what I felt. But I wanted to tell you about the effects of it. Because what it did is it drove me back to Calvin. And I remember taking down the institutes. And I think when I read that God knowledge is self knowledge, I was hooked. I was hooked also by Calvert's writings on freedom, on freedom of conscience, which I know fueled revolutions in Europe at the time. And his biblical scholarship was just simply in, uh, overwhelming. 
So today I want to thank you because of what you did that day. My Huguenot uh, roots has been united with my spirituality. And I dream of having Ignatius and John Calvin to lunch and listening to their conversation because I'm pretty sure they would find a lot of common cause, such as their love of God. So Dirkie, I hope you know how much you have meant to your students over the years. How you manage so many masters and doctoral students at the same time, none of us will ever understand. But I know from those that I have met and worked with what you meant to them. And I also hope that you will know now at your 70th year that you've meant a great deal to your colleagues. So I want to wish you much enjoyment for your celebration. And I really hope that you know that we miss you and that we wish you many, many blessings. So go well and keep well. Thank you, Denise. Yes, and, and these words, uh, of course, from Professor Denise Ackerman, who was for many years the colleague of Turkey at the University of Western Cape and, and also taught here at, at Stellenbosch University and has written many wonderful books, uh, including After the Locust and also Surprised by the Man on the Borrowed Donkey. And as she also expressed, uh, you know, somebody who Professor Schmidt always have held in, in, in very high regard. So we are, are very grateful to have listened also to that recording. Uh, and then uh, I, will, I will go ahead then and, and read also the, the, the words from Professor Michal Welker. And uh, let, let me then continue with this. Uh, this is Professor Welker uh, speaking. The, the friendship with Dirk Smith goes back to the midst of the 1990s in Heidelberg, later to common stays at the Center for Theological Inquiry in Princeton and to several occasions at the University of Stellenbosch. I dare to say that we have become theological soulmates over the years. We cooperated in many conferences and consultations in Germany, the United States and South Africa, which led to joint publications. Several consultations on reformed theology in general and on the Heidelberg Catechism in particular on issues of justice and freedom, on anthropology, on civil societies in South Africa and Germany were blessed by Dirkie's presence and his creative contributions. I am a great admirer of his work, its enormous theological depth and width and an unfathomable knowledge of theological developments in many countries. He does not only concentrate on so-called leading thinkers. Very often, he surprised me with his detailed knowledge of most recent developments of thought of my doctoral students and theological assistants, informations and insights better than I had. I think of him as a South African Bonifer with an enormous theological creativity and a great passion for justice and truth and deeper theological insights. The two persons on the, this planet who have the best knowledge of my theology and sometimes know details of my 500 publications of books and articles better than I do are Dirk Smit and his formal, former doctoral student, Hinko van der Westeisen, who wrote a dissertation on my theology. Often they show me limits and develop mental possibilities and I am deeply grateful to them. Dirk and Ria, were frequent visitors in Heidelberg. In the last 15 years, he was several times a visiting scholar at our research center for international interdisciplinary theology in Heidelberg. Over many years, he was part of our board of 20 evaluators of the annual given Manfred Lauterschlager Award for Theological Promise. 10, win 10 winners are elected each year for the best dissertation on the topic God and spirituality broadly understood. They come from all over the world, 
not only from Christian backgrounds and not only from theology and religious studies. 90% of our winners are already active as professors. And this success is correlated with our excellent evaluators. In the coming year, Dirki will give the ceremonial address at our award celebration. Uh, Professor Valker, uh, thank you very much for, for these uh, very um, profound words, and uh, I'm sure they are also very much appreciated. Uh, and uh, we are grateful and we are sorry that we couldn't listen to you in person, but we are uh, at least thankful that we could, could have your text. So thank you very much uh, for that and for participating also in this indirect way. Now, uh, the last commendation is from Professor Smith's uh, former colleague and also doctoral student, Professor Nico Kuchman, uh, who is, is well known himself as a theologian also within the networks of public theology and who is currently the vice rector for social impact transformation and personnel at Stellenbosch University, also a former dean of the faculty. And to himself also, uh, also celebrated a major birthday when he turned 60 uh, a few months ago. And on that occasion, Professor, Professor Smith also reflected on his work. Uh, so Nico, Nico uh, we, we listen, um, look forward to listen to you also in, in this capacity. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Robert. Uh, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak a few words. Uh, and Dirk, it is great seeing you here in, in my house on the screen. Uh, when you are invited to say something about Dirk Smith, at least two sets of emotions take control of you. At his 70th birthday in two days time, this is even more the case. On the one hand, you are immediately excited and energized and enthusiastic. There is so much that you want to say and share from the bottom of your heart. You are almost filled with holy impatience to start talking. Robert, here he might work on per se when Robert says, Nico, can you, can you say a few words? On the other hand, you are overcautious. Turkey always gives his very best for others. And you are concerned that you do not do justice to him. You are also concerned that you do not do justice to the manifold rich facets of the person of Turkey and to the multitude of interdependent themes in his work. Moreover, having him as Dr. Father and lifelong mentor also implies that at different phases and challenges in your personal and professional life, you emphasize and drink from different aspects of his person and work that might serve as stronger in specific moments. Another aspect to, to consider when you speak about Dirk Smith is the fact that what he says is so rich and deep and cherished that your response to it might imply that you will in a year or two discover that you did not sink deep enough in October, 2021, and that there are more layers to uncover. And even after you have spoken tonight, you might go home and think, my world, I should have said this or that as well, or I should rather have omitted this or that. Tonight, I share one perspective on Dirki that might serve as one key for understanding his wealth of insights. This perspective is prompted by the following narrative about the birth of the Confession of Belhar. When the Dutch Reformed Mission Church Synod declared in 1982, a status confessionis amidst the theological legitimation of apartheid, a decision was also taken to draft the Belhar Confession. Turkey served in the drafting committee. At the committee meeting, Prof. Yab Durant, who also served in the committee, requested that the committee 
should not, should not think out new ideas and formulations, but that they should simply articulate what the people of the Dutch Reformed Mission Church believe. Turkey as main author, and we know he doesn't like that expression. Turkey worked on the draft during that night. And the next morning, the draft confession was finalized by the committee and was ready for submission to Senate. That draft enjoyed immediate and intuitive positive reception amongst members of Senate and later amongst congregants of the Dutch Reformed Mission Church when they dealt with it. Stories are told about Dutch Reformed Church, Dominis who took the reference to Belar out of the heading and shared just the contents with their congregants and they intuitively identified with the contents of Belar, even though many of them were skeptical about the confessional status of Belar. Later, Belar enjoyed intuitive reception and appreciation internationally. How did a 29-year-old theologian of the University of the Western Cape and of the Dutch Reformed Mission Church succeed to articulate the faith that lives in the hearts of people so truthfully and so faithfully and so speedily? A few weeks ago, I shared on my social media, Facebook, extracts from Belhar, and I was overwhelmed by the requests from people who just wanted to say, send me the text of Belhar. I, I want to read it. Yes, I think it is because this young theologian, theologian knows about confessions, and specifically reformed confessions. Yes, it is because this theologian has distinctive gifts of heart and head and hand. But I think there's one more set of reasons to consider. Erki Smith has the capacity to listen and to pay attention. When I started to serve as chaplain at UWC, students of various faculties told the new chaplain about a professor of theology who preached in the chapel before I arrived. And they said, his sermons made them say, the man lays thrones off. This man eavesdrop on our most private and honest conversations. This man knows us. Turkey especially pays attention to and listens to the plight of the most vulnerable. For many years, a photo of an informal settlement was just above the screen of his computer in his Stellenbosch office, and not without reason. Linked to this capacity of sympathetic, empathetic, and interpathic attention paying and listening, Turkey also exercised throughout his life the capacity to include a diversity of people. Even in his many international research endeavors, as other colleagues also said, he practiced communion and inclusion, making sure that the diversity of others are part of the, pro of the projects. And Durkee, as senior and brilliant as he is, always shows humility, prefers question marks, shows awareness of the consistent threat of misunderstanding, shows awareness of the unintended negative consequences of well-meant words and endeavors. These features of the person Dirkie Smith show that Dirkie does not only articulate and confess what is written in Belar, but that he also embodies it. Maybe I can make this statement because he embodies these truths from his youth he could lead us in formulating Belar. And he can consistently encourage us to embody Belar. I'm close to concluding. To confess and embody togetherness and unity in search of reconciliation and justice, especially justice to the most vulnerable, is needed in intensified manner in our day where togetherness keeps on slipping through our fingers. 
in these days where polarization along color, socioeconomic gender, orientation and other lines seems to receive new life. In these days where the life of compassionate justice to all, especially to the most vulnerable, keeps on eluding us and is rather intensified in COVID time. Colleagues Hendrik Bosman, Elna Muton and I taught a course together on racism, human rights, poverty and gender justice many years ago. Osi consistently asked, how do we get beyond racism, beyond sexism, beyond classism, etc.? In the company of the person Dirkie Smith, and in the company of his work and witness, in which I now share for 40 years since he started at UWC in 1981. I experienced that I come a little closer to this beyond, the beyond toward which Pelar prompts us. Today on the brink of your 70th birthday, Dirkie, this Pelar logic is the perspective that I want to share. And I do it with gratitude for the grace that we taste in the gift of grace to Ria and the children and grandchildren and family and to all of us. The gift of grace, Dirk Jacobus Smith. May I conclude with that benediction. May God protect you and yours and bless you. May God make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom, lekker vir jaar omaat. Thank you very much, Nico, for also blessing us with your, with your words. And uh, we also have on our program uh, now an, uh, another 15 minutes or so for uh, Dirkie to respond. Uh, Dirkie, please uh, use the whole 15 minutes, uh, use the time allocated to you. Um, we, we look forward also to, to listen to you. We didn't want to give you too much time because you know sometimes it's not really a gift for your birthday if you need to do a lot of work, uh, but feel free to also respond. Uh, take the time you need also in, in light of what you have heard over these few days and also now in, with these uh, commendations. Thank you, Dirkie. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, 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 dear uh, uh, Robert and, and Dion and Sipo and uh, all the others uh, involved in this uh, wonderful symposium. So fr from those of you who had the original idea to all those who must have planned together and, and worked together at, at UWC, at Stellenbosch and, and here at uh, Princeton. To all those who chaired the sessions, uh, Enko and Tanya and John, uh, Robert now. To all those who, who took so much time and trouble to prepare such wonderful academic contributions, I, I really felt bad, even guilty about that. And, in, uh, that you had to do things like that in, in, in such busy times. So uh, to the main and, and Ella and Ashwin for yesterday morning uh, on our many seemingly um, irreconcilable differences to Rachel and Kerry and Ernst on the complex relations between uh, words and life to, to Hannah and Rothney and Nadia this morning on, on good news and its affordances. Um, to Arsi and uh, Marius uh, for their short comments on their doctoral progress. Um, I spent a major time of my life uh, listening to comments to this, uh, like that, it was it was great to listen to you. Um, to all those who took part in the fascinating uh, discussions, questions and answers sessions that we had, 
so to, to everyone who attended from many places, um, and especially for all the very friendly comments in the chat, and now the, uh, the seven friends and colleagues who spoke uh, for me really movingly. To Tuma Rita Sneiman for all the work behind the scenes, I, my, my most sincere thanks. I, I deeply appreciated what was again an unexpected surprise like 10 years ago. Uh, 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 thanks for the fact that you remembered me and, and to all the every detail of all this kindness. Uh, uh, it means more to me than you will ever uh, imagine. Last Friday, I listened to another panel discussion on the web when an impressive international uh, series of lectures on public theology was launched by the Lutheran World Federation together with uh, Berlin's uh, Humboldt University and, and uh, the Bayes Nadia Center. Uh, and uh, Professor Chaka Rothney was one of the panelists. And during the discussion, uh, he sort of confessed that he is a sucker for conversation. <laughs> At the time, I fondly remembered the many hours of conversation with him in my office that, that he also today uh, referred to. Uh, he, would, he would often come to my office and sit and do his own work in my office at another table for, for, for hours, but, but it was more of an excuse for both of us to have the opportunity just to talk. Um, I remember how he loved conversation and how, he, how often he would complain about the other students that they don't read enough and they don't care enough and they, they don't ask enough critical questions and they don't want to debate. and. Um, and they were, they were not interested in inquiry. And, and in fact, they were, they just did not love, uh, uh, they did not want to have conversations with us. So, so he used me and, and uh, I deeply appreciated uh, and enjoyed it. But on Friday, uh, he was very serious. He was attempting to explain why he remains involved in doing public theology himself, almost against his own will, since he is so deeply critical of what is often called public theology. And that is when he explained that, that it is because he believes in conversation. In many contexts, he said, conversation seems to be our only hope to overcome the destructive hermeneutics of suspicion that so deeply separate us from one another in our world today and make it so difficult to find the truth of which Rachel spoke. Uh, listening to, to Rodney on Friday, I thought what a wonderful living legacy it would be if many of our next generations of students would also be such suckers for conversation. I always treasured the, the well-known metaphor of the literary critic here from New Jersey, Kenneth Burke, of, of ongoing conversations in a parlor. It has been used to describe the nature of universities and of scholarship. It has been used to describe the nature of academic disciplines and of studies. It has been used to describe the nature of, of knowledge and of traditions. It has been used to describe the nature of all hermeneutics, of, of how we read texts and interpret art and play games and find our ways in life. It has been used to describe the nature of all human understanding. And here at Princeton uh, uh, Seminary nowadays, some of us use this metaphor in our introductory courses to reflect on the nature of, of doing theology. 
Imagine that you enter a parlor, Burke wrote in his uh, philosophy of literary forms. You come late, but when you arrive, others have long preceded you and they are engaged in heated discussions, discussions so heated, too heated for them to pause and tell you exactly what it is all about. In fact, these discussions had already begun long before any of them got there. So no one present is qualified to retrace for you all the steps that had gone before. You listen for a while, perhaps moving to different tables, to different discussions, until you decide that somewhere you have caught the tenor of the argument and, and you share your own perspective. Someone answers, you answer back, others come to your defense, some others align themselves against you, others raise further questions and the conversation continues. The discussion, Burke says, is interminable. The hour grows late, you must depart, and you do depart with the conversations still vigorously in progress. Such is theology, studying theology, doing theology, teaching theology, embodying theology, living theology. Here in Princeton, Karl Barth would famously give similar descriptions of the task of theology in his Warfield lectures in 1961 published as uh, Evangelical Theology and Introduction. Doing Evangelical Theology consists of ongoing conversation uh, with the strange new world of the scriptures, listening to conversations from before us, uh, sharing conversations with others around us, near and far, and trusting conversations for the future in the hands of those who stay and follow. In his very last public letter, the very last public letter which Bart wrote, addressed to Christians in Southeast Asia, he would therefore express his surprise that they were interested in the little bit of theology which he did in his limited social and historical moment. They should not try to continue to think and speak in the ways he did, he wrote to them, but they should find their own way and do their own theology for their own context. It was now their turn in their place, facing their struggles for their times. Now, of course, being Bart, he did continue to give them some friendly advice, which was in itself quite a mouthful. The legacy will, will be alive only if new generations do not keep returning to old struggles and repeat answers to yesteryear's questions, but find their own voices for their own times and their own places. Some of you will know that I also treasure the wonderful story about Moses in the Babylonian Talmud, Menachot 29b, where Moses ascends on high and finds the Holy One busy tying crowns on the letters of the Torah. Surprised, Moses asks the master of the universe whether all these small additions to the letters are really necessary. And the explanation comes that after several generations, someone called Akiva ben Yosef will be born. 
and he will derive from each of these small crowns on the letters mounds and mounds of instruction and teaching. So overwhelmed, Moses asks to see this rabbi from the future. And he is shown to the study hall where Rabbi Akiva is teaching. But Moses fails to understand a single word that the rabbi is saying, and he feels completely despondent. Until a student in the class asks the rabbi, where do you get all of this? How do you know all of this? And Rabbi Akiva answers, we received all of this already from Moses on Sinai. When Moses heard this, the Talmud says, his heart was put completely at ease. And this is how tradition works, as Dr. Reichel Hanna so convincingly showed us earlier today. It, it was always all already there, but new generations had to see and confess and embody it. Now, this whole event was organized in such a way that it embodied many of the aspects of Kenneth Burke's metaphor. And for that, I am deeply grateful. I refrain from comments on, on, on several of these aspects. The fact that it was organized as a conversation, which I liked, uh, the collaboration between the institutions, which I liked, the intriguing topics, which I liked, and the diversity of the participants and the perspectives. I, I comment only on one aspect of the metaphor. On, on many previous occasions, during many events and during, in many writings, I had opportunities to thank those who were already part of the fascinating conversations in the parlor of theology before me, or those who were there together with me. So my own teachers and my colleagues and my friends, from abroad, from many places, friends and colleagues of many decades and from everywhere. Some of us are here with us. Some of them spoke this morning. Um, and uh, some were in the chat uh, as, uh, as representing others who, who were not here, but uh, that I remember over, over the years, I have been extremely privileged with colleagues and friends, and for that I am very grateful. On this occasion, however, you, and this is the aspect, uh, you deliberately gave voice to next generations, to representatives of younger generations, younger colleagues, former students, in some cases, even students of my former students, to my wonderful new colleagues here in Princeton, to my new students here. And you will know how deeply I appreciate this and how important all these next generations doing theology have always been to me. L listening to the speakers, I was reminded of so many other faces over the years. Now, on an occasion like this, like a 70th birthday, the important aspect of the metaphor is obviously the fact that the hour grows late and that we all have to depart with these conversations still vigorously in progress after we are gone. The challenging question is therefore about the quality of these ongoing conversations and the speakers who spoke here and the penetrating questions that they asked and the sensitive arguments that they developed and, and the insightful conversations that they had all, all together promise so very well for the future. 
but still we know only too well that conversations in theology and church can go wrong, terribly wrong. They have gone wrong in the past and they are still going wrong in so many tragic ways today. We were reminded of that in several of our talks here together, especially yesterday. Not any and all conversations belong in this parlor. After all, theology is an ongoing conversation about something, about good news, about love and grace and justice and reconciliation and peace and hope and flourishing and joy about God's yes to God's world and to God's people as this morning's first session powerfully reminded us. And because it is about God's yes, it should often be in the form of a no, the no of critique and refusal and resistance against all and everything that denies and betrays God's yes. But this is probably what made Professor Chaka so serious last Friday when he said that he is a sucker for conversation. This is probably also why Bart could not refrain from giving the Christians in Southeast Asia some friendly advice, although he encouraged them to continue with their own conversations and forget about him. And this is probably also why I would hope to hang around in the parlor just a little while longer, mostly listening and learning, but who knows if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Turkey. And uh, we are also grateful that you will still be hanging around. So thank you very much for this. Um, and we are now, uh, we can now conclude also over to, to Dion, uh, just to lead us uh, in a closing prayer. Thank you very much.